In this video, we are going to continue to review the SAT practice test number 10, and this is available on the College Board website. Recall from part one of this video, we left off at problem 13 in the no calculator section. So let's proceed. It says in the XY plane, okay, don't forget, that's this here, the function f of x equals x squared plus 5x plus 4, and it has two x-intercepts. What is the difference between these two x-intercepts? Okay, recall folks, this is the x-axis and this is the y-axis. And because this is a quadratic equation with a degree of 2, we know we're dealing with a parabola. What else do we know about this parabola? We know it's upright because the coefficient is a positive 1. And we also know that the shape of the parabola is perfect, what I like to call perfect, meaning it is not wide, it is not narrow, but it's perfect. Okay, so this would be a wide parabola, and if we had a wide parabola, we would have a coefficient in front of the x squared that was a fraction that's less than 1. If it's a narrow parabola, then we would have a coefficient greater than 1. So this would be a narrow or a steep parabola and the coefficient in front of the x squared term would be greater than 1. And I think it's important to develop an intuition when you look at an equation as to what the shape you're dealing with. And that holds true whether you're dealing with a quadratic equation and a parabola or a linear equation like over here and a line. Okay, so let's get back to our problem at hand. They want to know what these intercepts are. Okay, so an x-intercept is going to cross the x-axis by definition. That's what the term intercept means. So what do you notice about the y value at the x-intercepts? Well, it's zero. And that's true with any x-intercept. No matter where you are in the x-axis, the y value is zero. Because look, if you went up, the y value would be positive 1 or positive 2. If you go down, it's going to be negative 1, negative 2, etc. But when you're right on the x-axis, you're neither up you're, you're, or down, you're at 0. So what can we do? Well, we know f of x is another way of saying y. It's the output of the function. So we can just put y here in lieu of f of x. So we want to know where this expression equals 0. So let's do that. Let's set x squared plus 5x plus 4 equal to 0. And we know we're going to get two solutions because this is a second degree equation. Okay, so what do we do here? Well, whenever we have a quadratic equation, the goal is to set it equal to 0, and hopefully this is factorable. Now, is this factorable? Let's see. We're going to put plus 4 in the box. There are two ways to get a positive number. You can either have two negatives multiplied by each other or two positives. So we need two numbers that multiply to positive 4 and add to positive 5. So we know it can't be two negative numbers being multiplied to lead you to this positive 4. How do we know that? Because the middle term is positive. So we know we are dealing with two positive numbers multiplied to each other that result in a product of 4 and a sum of 5. Well, they are no, none other than x plus 4 times x plus 1. And we set that equal to 0. Now, how do you solve this? How do you get the x values? What you do, folks, is you set each of these factors equal to 0. Because if this factor is 0, it doesn't matter what's happening here, the product is going to be 0. Similarly, if this is 0, the product is going to be 0. So we set x plus 4 equal to 0, and we set x plus 1 equal to 0, and then we solve for x in both scenarios. So here are our two x-intercepts negative 1 and negative 4. So clearly, when I drew this parabola, I was way off. The parabola really exists like so, crossing at negative 1. 
and negative 4, something like this. Okay. Now, the question asks, what is the distance between these two x-intercepts? So what's the distance between negative 4 and negative 1? Well, the answer is going to be C, 3. Now, if that's not immediately evident to you, use a number line. Okay. So how do you get from negative 1 to negative 4? You traverse three units on the number line. Let's move on to the next one. Okay. Square root of 4x equals x minus 3. What are the values that so satisfy this given equation? So basically, folks, we have to solve for x. So how do we handle this? Well, we have x on both sides of the equation. Notice that this radical sign covers the entire length of the 4x. In other words, you are not dealing with this. Okay, So how do we handle something like this? Well, you got to get rid of this radical sign. And we know there's an implicit 2 here because it's not listed. So we know we're dealing with the square root. And the way you get rid of a square root is you square it. So what we're going to do is we are going to square both sides. We're going to raise both sides of the equation to the second power. That yellow doesn't show up very well, does it? Let's switch to blue. Okay, so we are going to square both sides. Now, very important. I'm going to stop right here. Whenever you square both sides of an equation, actually, Whenever you raise something to the, an even power, it could be 4, 6, etc., you have to check your answers. Okay. So it should be an immediate reflex. When you are squaring both sides of the equation in an attempt to solve for x, which is what are we doing here, you have to check your solutions. Okay, we'll see how that plays a role in a moment. So when we square a radical raised to the second power, it gets rid of the radical. So the square root of 4x squared is simply 4x. On the opposite side, we have a binomial. This is not x squared minus 9. This is, don't forget, x minus 3 times x minus 3. So we are going to FOIL here. Remember the acronym FOIL? first, outside, inside, last. Okay, so that's going to give us x squared minus 3x minus 3x plus 9. That's going to simplify to 4x equals x squared minus 6x plus 9. We want to solve this. How do we solve quadratic equations? We set it equal to 0 and we factor. So when we, in our mind, when we throw this to the opposite side, we're going to have x squared minus 10x plus 9 equals 0. OK. How do we factor this? We put plus 9 in the box. There are two ways to get to a positive number when you are multiplying. Two negatives or two positives. What are we dealing with here? It's two negatives. How do we know that? Because the middle term is negative. So we are looking for two negative numbers multiplied to each other that give us positive 9 and negative 10. And they are none other than oops, x minus 9 and x minus 1 equals 0. Again, we set both factors equal to 0, and we get x equals 9, and x equals 1. Okay. So this problem, if you don't remember to check your solutions, you would choose 1 and 2, because these are our solutions. But you have to check your solutions whenever you raise to an even number. So let's do that. So 
we have x equals 1 and x equals 9. Let's check this one first. We're going to plug in x equals 1. We're going to get the square root of 4 times 1 equals 1 minus 3. Again, all we did is plug in x equals 1 here. Square root of 4 equals negative 2. 2 equals negative 2. That is false. Therefore, this is rejected. If you try 9, you're going to get the square root of 36 equals 9 minus 3. 6 equals 6. That checks. Therefore, the answer to this equation or this problem is 2 only, and that is choice B. Okay, now a couple things before we leave this problem. Let's look at why squaring this radical gets rid of the radical, okay? Let's look at that. Folks, what's another way to write radical 4x? How would we write this as an exponent? It would be 4x to the 1 half power. So if we raise this, second power. We're going to employ the power rule. Whenever you have a constant or a variable or both raised to an exponent and that in turn is raised to an exponent, you're allowed to multiply these two numbers like this. So when you multiply two, 1 half times 2, this becomes 4x to the first power and that is why when you square a radical sign, it, it goes away. One last thing, uh, I just want to let you know a mnemonic that works for me. Don't forget, the risk of sounding repetitive, when you square both sides in an attempt to solve for x, you have to check your solutions. We just found that out. So when you square both sides, you check your solutions. Do I, I remember this. If you go back to junior high when they taught us square dancing. And I should have done this a little more efficiently, sorry. And you have a male and a female square dancing. Well, there's one point where you, we all move around and I think the girls go, the guys stay, or you go different directions. So whenever the music stops or at some point in that, our instructor always reminded us to check your partner. Make sure you're with your original partner. So that's how I remember it, because the partners could easily get jumbled up in this scenario. So during a square dance, when you do this maneuver, you always check your partner. Same thing with the solutions. That's the crazy way that I remember it. And as you folks know, those are the best mnemonic devices, the ones that are crazy. Okay, let's go to number 15. In the system of equations above, A is a constant. For which of the values of A does the system have no solution? The key to this, folks, is to look at this system of equation like two lines. What do we know about two lines that don't intersect? We have two lines here. I keep wanting to use yellow, which doesn't show up. If you have two lines that intersect, this xy coordinate would be the solution to the system of equation where the two equations are here and here. In other words, this, e this line has an equation. Let's say this is y equals 2x plus 2. And this one is y equals negative 3x plus 1. If you had a system of equations with these two equations, this xy coordinate would satisfy that system. In other words, where they intersect. Okay. Compare and contrast that scenario where the lines intersect and you have a solution to this scenario. Sorry, having 
trouble uh, erasing. Let's try this. Compare and contrast this scenario where the lines intersect to this scenario. Here are two lines, and they don't intersect. These two lines, if they were depicted, if their equations were depicted in a system of equations, that system would have no solutions. Okay, and that's what we're looking for here. What value of A creates this scenario? Okay, so the first thing I would do here is I would convert both of these to Y equals MX plus B format. That's what you're dealing with. You have two lines. These are both linear equations. So the first one on top is going to be y equals 3x plus 6. The second one is going to take two steps. First, we're going to do 2y equals negative ax plus 4. And then we're going to divide both sides by 2. eventually get y equals negative a over 2 x plus 2. Okay, let's do some erasing. Okay, folks, what do you notice about these two red lines that don't intersect and therefore do not have a solution if the equations were placed in a system? What do you notice about these two? Well, their slope is the same. When you have two lines with the same slope and a different y-intercept, that's the definition of a system of equations with no solutions. So what we need to do is we need to put an a in here that gives us the same slope as this line. So we're going to set negative a over 2 equal to 3 and we are going to solve for a and that's going to give us our answer. Okay, how do we solve for a here? Well, what I like to do is I like to convert this to a fraction and now we have two fractions facing each other with an equal sign that gives us license to cross multiply. So I'm going to have negative a equals 2 times 3, which is 6. Then I'm going to divide both sides by negative 1. And the final answer is going to be negative 6. Choice A. Again, you see a system of equations. You recognize these as two lines. If they have no solutions, they got to be parallel. If they're parallel, by definition, their slope is the same. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so folks, we're now moving into problem 15, which is the first of the write-ins. I should say 16. First of the write-ins. So I think it's important to go ahead and look at the directions here on the write-ins before the exam so you're familiar with what to do and what not to do. Here are some of the highlights. No question has a negative answer. So if you're doing one of these problems and you get a negative answer, you did something wrong. No mixed numbers. Can't put in three and a half. Have to change it to 3.5 or seven halves. Okay. If you put three and one half, if you put 31 slash two, thinking that that's valid for three and a half, the computer's going to see it as 31 over 2. Last thing, decimal answers. You can either round them or truncate them. Truncate means just to cut off. <clears throat> so here, 2 thirds is 0.66 that goes on ad infinitum. You can truncate it as is, or you can round the last six up to seven. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Okay, let's move on to number 16. Again, I didn't mention it in this video, but it's important to pause, read these problems yourself, and then try them on your own. Manufacturer shift is uh, shipping products to two locations. The equation above shows the total shipping cost in dollars for shipping C units to the closer location and F units to the farther. If the total shipping cost was 47000 okay, stop right there. Doing word problems is about stopping and taking notes. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute 47000 for T. And 3,000 units were shipped to the farther location. Okay, so farther location is F. That means F equals 3,000. So I'm going to plug that in. How many units were shipped to the closer location? So basically, we just need to solve for C here. Okay. So again, there's no calculator here. So when there's no calculator, we look for little tricks. If we had all even numbers, for example, I might divide by 2 to make things easier. If we had all numbers with a lot of zeros, I might divide by 100 to make things easier. But we don't really have that here. So what we're going to do is we are going to subtract 47,000 minus this. We're going to bring that to the opposite side of the equal sign. So what is 12 times 3,000? That's going to be 36,000. If that's not immediately obvious to you, you can just do this. That's a little simpler for some folks. So we're going to have 36,000 on the other side, but it's going to be minus. So let's just go ahead and do that right now. So we're going to have 11,000 equals 5C. And when you divide when you divide 11,000 by 5, you'll get 2,200. So that is your answer. 17. Absolute value of 2x plus 1 equals 5. What is the value of the absolute value of 8 minus b? Okay, this is how you handle absolute value problems, folks. You take the 2x plus 1, which is inside, you set it to 5, and then you set it to negative 5. And then you proceed to solve for x. So here, I'm going to throw this plus 1 to the opposite side, change the sign. You're going to get 2x equals 4, x equals 2. Here, you're going to throw the positive 1 to the opposite side, get negative 1. You're going to get 2x equals negative 6, and x equals negative 3. Now, the fact that they have absolute value here means it doesn't matter what order you put these in. So the absolute value of 2 minus negative 3 is going to be the absolute value of 2 plus 3, or 5. So that is your final answer. That's what you would key in. Now, let's take a moment to talk about absolute value, because a lot of times on the SAT, you need to know the intuition of what's going on with absolute value. When you have two terms in absolute value sign. Absolute value has to do with distance. Okay, So when you look at 2x plus 1, what you are really looking at is the distance between 2x and minus 1. Distance is always denoted by subtraction. Okay, if you want to find the distance between 5 and 12, you do 12 minus 5, and it gives you 7. Okay, when you're looking at the distance between two numbers, 
subtraction comes into play. Okay, so look what's going on here. This 2x plus 1 is the difference, or excuse me, the distance between 2x and negative 1. And they're saying that that distance is 5. So if we go to a number line, I always plot zero first. The distance between negative one, which I can plot, and two x is five. So what we're gonna do, folks, is we're gonna go five in each direction. And that's going to take us to 2x. So this is going to be 2x, and that's going to be 2x. But we know if you move five spots in this direction, if you add 5 to negative 1, you're going to be at positive 4. If you go 5 in the negative direction from negative 1, you're going to be at negative 6. Therefore, 2x equals negative 6, and 2x equals 4, x equals negative 3, x equals positive 2. Same answers we got by using the technique of setting it to both positive 5 and negative 5. If you're doing this on the test, of course you do it the way we initially did it, setting the contents of the absolute value signs to 5 and then negative 5 solving for x. But there might be another question on the SAT that involves absolute values that need, that requires, excuse me, that you know the intuition between absolute value. Absolute value is about distance. Okay, let's go now to number 18. Okay. 18 is a exponential equation. Okay. Let's look at this. Juan purchased an antique that had a value of 200 at the time of the purchase. Each year, the value is estimated to increase 10% over its value from the previous year. The estimated value two years after the purchase can be represented with 200A, where A is a constant. What is the value of A? Okay. Exponential equations can be recognized when you see increase or decrease by a percentage. Whenever you see that, you're dealing with an exponential equation. Exponential equations can be modeled like so. y equals a times b to the x. I think a better way to think of this is as follows a of t is a initial times a rate times time. Okay. A, a naught means the initial amount. T, a of t means the amount after time t. And r is the rate of change. Could be either going up or going down. I like this. This is a better intuition for me than that. So I'm going to take away y equals a b to the x, and let's work with what I have here now in red. Purchase an antique that had a value of $200 at the time of the purchase. At the time of the purchase. That means t equals zero. No time has elapsed. So if we plug in t equals 0, it doesn't matter what the rate is. Anything to the 0 power is 1. So a sub 0 is going to be a of time 0 
A of zero is your initial amount. So now I can plug in two hundred for the initial amount. Each year the value of the antique is estimated to increase by ten percent. Whenever you see increase by ten percent, use this formula. 1 plus or minus r. And you're going to use the decimal value of the percent. So the decimal value of 10% is 0.1. You plug that in for here. You're going to use 1.1 to designate a 10% increase. 1 plus or minus r, where r is the decimal value of the percent. If they told you that, let's say we had a totally different problem unrelated to this. If they told you that the rate was decreasing by 20%, you would change this to a decimal, 0.2. You would do 1 minus 0.2, and you would use 0.8 as your value. But here, we are increasing by 10%, so we are going to use 1.1. So let's do that. So now we have A of T equals 200 times 1.1 times T. All right, let's erase these here and keep going. So now what do they tell us? The estimated value two years after purchase. So that means T is going to equal 2. Can be represented as 200 times A. Get that arrow out of the way. So this value two years after A of T is this. So A of 2, meaning A after 2 years, equals 200A. So now instead of A of T, or A of 2, we're going to put 200A in here. Instead of T, we're going to put 2. So now we have this. What is the value of A? We have to solve for A. Okay, fortunately, they gave us 200 twice, so we can divide both sides by 200. And we have A equals 1.1 to the second power. 11 squared is 121, and when you figure out the decimal point, the final answer is going to be 1.21. Folks, I think it's very important, as an aside, to memorize all the perfect squares. Here, 11 times 11 is not too bad, but it, there will be a problem on this test, trust me, where knowing all the perfect squares from 10 to 20 will be helpful. So I recommend that you put to memory 11 squared is 121. 12 squared, 144. 13 squared is 169. 14 squared is 196. And the way I remember that is that 13-year-olds and 14-year-olds have a special relationship. And 169 and 196, you just reverse those numbers. 15 squared is 225. 16 squared equals 256, 17 squared is 289, 18 squared is 324, 19 squared is 361, and 20 squared, of course, is 400. So folks, I would take a screenshot of that, and that'll remind you to go ahead and memorize those.
Next problem, system of equations. Based on the equations above, what is the value of 5x plus 5y? Now folks, often on the SAT, there's a quick way to do a problem. So I always look for that before I proceed and, and try to grind through something. So we know how to solve this system of equations the hard way or the traditional way. You know, we would multiply this by negative 3 and this by 2, and that would give us negative 6x, positive 6x, and then we would add the equations, the x would go away, we would solve for y, plug back in, etc., etc. But take a look at this. Okay. The first thing, when I see 5x plus 5y, what does that equal? I would ask myself, is there anything to multiply either of these equations to get 5x plus 5y easily? All right. There isn't. Okay, so that didn't work. Because let's say I multiplied this by something and I got 5x plus 5y equals 1200 times something then I would be done, whatever that 1,200 times something equaled. But we don't have that here. Okay. Sorry, my erasing mechanism is inconsistent today. But what we do have is if you add these equations, what do you notice? 5x plus 5y. There's your answer. Look for a quick way to do something. Next one. If u plus t equals 5 and u minus t equals 2, what is the value of this expression? Okay, you see this format right there? That is the difference between two perfect squares. That should jump out at you like an alarm bell. That is u plus t times u minus t. u plus t equals 5. u minus t equals 2. Twenty is your final answer. So important to recognize this. You will see this all over the SAT. For example, x squared minus 9. That is going to be x plus 3 times x minus 3. Difference between two perfect squares. That's why I want you to memorize all the squares from 10 to 20, because you might see this as part of a problem. And because you've memorized that that's 14 squared, you'll be able to immediately recognize it like so. Another thing they'll do is they'll put some extra factors in there. So you might see this. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the difference between two perfect squares. You will see that on the test. And a, a, a hidden one that they like to do is x squared minus 1. Don't forget that 1 is a perfect square. 